welcome to e sectiona uh, so last class uh, uh, we had studied uh, we had looked upon uh, different types of uh, fire causes of fire sources of fire different sources of fires so this class uh, uh, will uh, this session we look at uh, uh, development of fire how to mitigate the fire in the building so development of fire um, there are four stages how fire can develop so uh, one is incipient stage smoldering stage flame stage uncontrolled stage these are the four stages how the fire can develop so in the incipient stage what happens invisible products of combustion are given off no visible smoke flame or heat is still not present incipient stage is the early stage of the fire when ignition happens due to some accident or some something so a uh, very initial stage is called as incipient stage so invisible products of combustion are given off no visible smoke smoke will not be there flame will not be there or heat is still not present so that is the very initial stage that is first stage then the smoldering stage smoldering stage if the burning process is slow if the flame is slow burning process is slow without any flames it can be termed as smoldering when we have to call it as smoldering there should not be any flames coming up from the incident right so that time it can be called as smoldering stage if the burning process is slow without any fl flames say uh, flames are not coming up so much it it can be considered as only slight uh, burning process is happening so it can be called considered as smoldering stage combustion products are now visible as smoke the by product of combustion are visible means now the smoke can be spread say after the inception stage it has started uh, increasing so maybe it can be considered as uh, uh, maybe it may, uh, there is a smoke inside the space flame but there is no flame or heat it is still not present flame burning flames or heat in the space is still not present only the smoke and the burning processes is happening flame stage actual fire now exist fire when which you call it as fire only when the flame is there so the flame exist so that is flame stage actual fire now exist appreciable heat is not present but follows almost instantaneously right still there is no much heat but there is a flame smoke but there is no much heat so that is flame stage now the fourth one uncontrolled stage when there is too much of heat heat content in the space in the inside inside the building or anywhere where the fire is occurred it could be a room house the whole building right so there is a heat present it could be the uh, open environment open environment heat is not very easy so that the amount of uh, fire is so much but in a building or a built space it is very fast so uncontrolled stage heat stage is at this point large amounts of heat and smoke is produced uncontrolled heat and fire is rapidly expanding in space so those are the four stages of growth of fires okay now the in the growth of fires the rate of growth of a fire depends on the fuel which is burning and other conditions such as supply of air to the fire fires in liquids and gases can grow very fast the size of a fire is measured by its heat release rate 
practically every fire can be extinguished within first few minutes if proper equipment is brought into the service by trained persons. This is most important. Fire is there, it cannot be easily controlled. So, in every fire, it can be extinguished within first few minutes, within first few minutes, if, if at all proper equipment is brought into service, proper equipment, required equipment is brought into the service and person who is use, using that should be a trained person. It has to be trained so that he knows how to use that, right. A lot of times uh, we see fire extinguishers running, uh, lying around the building even though the fire, there is a fire and there is, the, uh, people know that there is a fire extinguisher but because of the lack of knowledge of how to use it or maybe the awareness of instantaneous usage of that, so um, people might not be using it. But there should be some kind of training, trained personals in every building where they can use that and suffocate uh, and uh, suffice the fire, right. So depending on the fuel, depending on the fuel which is burning and other conditions such as supply of air should be there the fire, for the fire to increase. So on these two, the rate of growth of fire can happen. If it is liquid and gas, the growth is very fast, fire growth is very fast. So the size of a fire, the volume or size of a fire is measured by its heat release rate, heat release, say there is something called as heat release rate. So it is the evaluation for measuring the uh, size of a fire in a space. So now we can, we will see a graph how with respect to the time and the temperature, how the fire can grow. Now this is the time slab and temperature maximum up to 100 degrees centigrade is what is been shown here. So how the growth stage happens? In the ignition time it is very low, over the period of the time it increases, suddenly it starts increasing, there is a flash over, suddenly there will be a increase and this is where the flames stage happens. After the flame stage it just starts heating the space. So that is the burning stage. In this burning stage it takes up quite a time but the fire would not have reduced. Right? Then after sometimes it start decaying. So this is the growth of the fire, how it happens. So Initially, we still have lot of time here to suppress the fire. There is of time at the initial stage to suppress the fire. That is when if the equipment which is utilized in a building can be used at that particular moment, it can be completely reduced, the uh, damage can be reduced. So a fire which is allowed to spread creates panic amongst people and uh, panic in many cases has caused more loss of life than the fire itself. Panic itself can cause more loss of life, like you do not know what to do, how to handle the fire, so that itself can cause loss of life. Reasons for major spread of a fire, how spread can happen to the fire? Delayed discovery of fire, then there is no idea that there is a fire happening. So that delayed discovery itself is uh, there, then there is a growth of fire, you are allowing for the fire to grow. Missing damaged or uncharged firefighting equipment. So this is very important when we have these uh, equipment like fire extinguishers and other th fire hydrants etc. inside the building. And if it is not updated or checked or missed, if it is missed, damaged or uncharged, if the maintenance is not done to those equipments, there is again you are allowing for the growth of the fire. Lack of fire separation and compartmentalization, this is in the planning stage, 
fire separation and compartmentalization should be done in the planning stage of the building. Lack of effective fixed fire protection systems, leaks or spill, spillage of oils, greases, hydraulic fluids and fuels. These kind of liquids, fuels can cause more growth of fire. Lack of effective fixed fire protection systems. Fire protection systems are not installed in the building or not planned for it, then there is a loss of life and increase of fire. There could be substandard level of housekeeping that is as we discussed the maintenance of the equipments, restricted or difficult access for firefighters and fire engines. This is one more important thing. While we are planning itself even in the site plan of the structure, we have to plan such that fire engine and firefighters have to move around the building. So there is certain space is left or road width is left in the surrounding of the building so that it can be accessed by firefighters and fire engineers engines. So that is very important if there is no such access then there is a cause of fire. Unmanned or unmonitored areas, overstocking or overstoring of products, raw materials or engineering equipments, lack of suitably, suitably trained personnel available to deal with the fire in the fi vital first few minutes following ignition. So if somebody is able to handle the fire at the first few minutes of the ignition, then it is very easy to cut the fire growth. But if there are no such personnel available, that to train personnel available, then there is a growth of fire happening very easily. So based on this, now there is a classification for buildings, how buildings are classified based on how to handle the fire. So this is done as per the National Building Code Part 4. There is a part 4 from NBC which we refer for all the structural, uh, you know, all the requirements of necessities of building. So for fire it is part 4 which we have to refer from NBC. This is available online. It can be downloaded easily and you can go through the uh, classifications and the strategies which can be used for uh, codes and uh, regards for the fire safety. So according to them majorly the buildings all the building typologies are classified like group A, group B, group C, group D, E, G, E, F, G, H, J, right. So group A comes under residential, group B under uh, uh, educational comes under group B, institutional comes under group C, institutions, assembly halls, public buildings comes under group D, business business buildings, commercials, all the commercial centers, malls, etc. comes under group E. Mercantile buildings comes under group F. Industrial, all the industrial sectors comes under group G. Storage buildings, they separate category for storage itself. They have different way of addressing the fire in the building. So they, they come under group H hazardous buildings come under group J. So all the strategies which can be applied for building design are based on these. Now in this NBC part 4 fire and life safety document there are details like how to design the building if they are coming under these categories. So these categories are done based on the risk of the fire in the building. So residential it can be considered least when if com comparatively to hazardous. So based on the level of risk of the fire these classifications are done. right? And in land that is about the buildings classifications. Now in land planning also in urban planning and urban design in master planning also there are zones categorized. So in land development and town planning, fire zones are designated as follows. Fire zone number 1, number 2, number 3. 
So in fire zone number one, what all comes under? This comprises areas having residential, educational, institutional, assembly, small business, retail, mercantile, that is group A, B, C, D, E, under E, first category and then F. All these comes under fire zone number one. Fire zone number two, here we have uh, business buildings, industrial buildings, that is group E, part of the group E and part of the group G, except high hazard areas. In zone number 3, fire zone number 3, it comprises of high hazard industrial buildings, high hazard industrial buildings, storage buildings, which are prone to have fire and buildings for hazardous uses or areas which are under development for such occupancies. So these zones are separately dealt in the master planning level. Now we will see how um, these can be handled. So we saw how different causes of fire, sources of fire and then how uh, uh, growth of fire can occur, growth of uh, smoke can occur, how life losses can happen. Now the, the strategies which we have to apply for them are enormous. There are number of strategies which we can apply in buildings. Whether it is low rise, high rise, spread out buildings, campuses, different ways of application can be done to reduce the fire accidents or incidents. So this is one thing which we are looking at fire water storage. So as uh, water supply and uh, sanitation subject, we have learned about how to store the water for uh, facilities for of, uh, daily utilities. So there is a particular storage to be done for fire itself in each and every building certain amount of water has to be pro if you are planning if we are planning to have a fire uh, water to be used for fire there is separate storage to be done for fire water storage so water for fire protection system should be preferably from fresh water we know that there is a water tank fire tank fire water tank provided in majority of the buildings to suppress the fire so it has to be fresh water source only mostly such as river tubal etc right so fresh water is very essential for the storage it is not if it is not available easily then what is the option the option is fire water supply may be sea water or other acceptable source like recycled water if in only in the case of fresh water is not av available you can go for sea water. For fire water storage requirements, what are the different requirements or things which we have to consider? Regulatory requirement for fire water storage and pumping capacity differ from region to region. So the storage capacity is to be based on the area of the premises. The storage is mostly based on the area of the premises built up area of the premises or facility to be provided with fire protection and the facilities requiring special fire protection. So we have a calculation for uh, how to find out the size of the water tank or water storage requirement. A typical guideline for uh, fire water storage is calculated from the flow requirement. Okay. So the flow requirement can be calculated like this. Flow requirement is equal to A plus B plus C divided by 20 plus D liters per minute. This is the formula which is used to find out the flow requirement. So what is A plus B plus C? Where A is the building area. A is the building area. Total area in square meter of all the floors of the buildings in the premises. That is A is nothing but the total built up area of a building which comprises of the area, cumulative area of all the floors of the building. Right? Then we have B, storage area. Storage area, this is the total area in square meter 
of all floors and open space where combustible materials are stored. So, these if there is any particular combustible materials or sources are stored like gas cylinders, uh, um, it could be petrol, liquefied petroleum, LPG, everything, any combustible material, it could be a storage of a paper, etc., which can start the ignition. So, that should be, if you are categorizing that as a storage space, that also can be calculated separately which comes under B. Yeah. C is elevated floor area. The total area in square meters or of all floors over 15 meters above the ground above ground level. Say you have a building building level building level as 45 meters, 15 meters from the ground level finished from the ground level 15 meters has to be considered as elevated floor area. Total area in square meters of all floors over 15 meters of over 15 meters whatever floors are coming they are considered as elevated floor area. So, when we are designing high rise buildings, all the floors which is above 15 meters from the ground level comes under C category, right. So, D is area requiring special protection, say for example, such as storage, it can be outdoors of flammable gases and liquids such as LPG, fuel, oils, etc. So, if there is a special storage for these kind of activities, these kind of uh, fuels, it can be considered to have area requiring special protection. Only the numerical value of the area is to be taken for the above calculation. In areas where the fire risk is involved does not require use of water. Such areas under B, C, D may for the purpose of calculation be halved. You can con cut, consider that to be half. So, one example has been shown here for the understanding. So, this is the formula uh, flow requirement is equal to A plus that is total built up area, right? And B is. Uh, B is a storage area for the combustible materials and uh, C is elevated area, the flows which is above the 15 meter from the ground level. So, all of those divided by 20 plus D, if you have any special storage for liquids or fuels, that can be D, right. So, one example is like for a facility having a total building area of 10,000 square meters, that is A, built up area of the building is 10,000 square meters, 500 square meter of combustible material storage area, only for combustible material storage areas, uh, there is a 500 square meter of area provided and uh, above 15 meter the number of floors occupy 1000 square meters that is called as elevated floor area which is C and a special area of 500 square meters where fuels are can be stored like LPG, petrol, etc. The flow requirement is A plus B plus C divided by 20 plus D. So, you can see A is 10,000, B is 500. C is uh, 1000 divided by 20 plus 500 is a D. So, the total requirement of water is 1075 liter per minute that is the calculation. Now, considering 90 minutes for water to suppress the minimum calculation taken is 90 minutes that is one and a half hours of water flow is required. Now, if it is 1075 liters per minute, 
then what is the storage required for 90 minutes. So that into 90 minutes is equal to 96,750 liters of water storage is required for this kind of facility. So that is around 1 lakh liters separate water tank has to be provided for the water storage especially for fire and that fire water tank should always consist of water should always have water in that filled in that so that is the criteria for water storage okay so this water storage which is done it can be overhead or ground level it can be sump which is in the ground level or it can be a overhead water tank. You can keep the overhead water tank separately allocated for fire. So overhead, so overhead storage tanks may be provided if the fire water requirement is less than 50,000 liters. Now for the before uh, example which we took, took was 1 lakh liters. If the requirement is less than 50,000 liters then uh, we can go for overhead storage. If the fire water requirement is more than 50,000 liters, if the fire water requirement is more than 50,000 liters, brown water storage is provided. So now for 1 lakh liter, definitely there is a need of a ground water storage that is sump. In case of ground water tank suitable pumps and associated piping has to be installed suitable pump is very much necessary if we are storing the water in the ground so that is sump so suitable pump and associated piping has to be proper piping has to be done for the water to reach all the surfaces right so water for hydrant surface should be stored easily in easily accessible surface above ground reservoirs or tanks of steel or concrete masonry. Reservoir of an over 2,50,000 capacity should be in two interconnected compartments to facilitate cleaning and repairs. Uh, there is something called as hydrants which is used for suppressing the fire. Those are the equipments which can be installed over the city or the building to suppress the fire. So for that water is required. So for that storage of water, uh, water for hydrant service should be stored in easily accessible surface above ground reservoirs or tanks of steel and concrete masonry. So reservoir of over 2,50,000 capacity liters should be in two interconnected departments. Earlier the example which we discussed was 1 lakh liters what liters of water for fire storage tank right so the reservoirs of and over 250000 capacity should be in two interconnected compartments that means now if we have a ground level if this is a sump the sump has to be divided into two parts so the total of this should come under 2,50,000 capacity. Storage design in the storage could be capable of delivering the flow calculated for at least 90 to 100 minutes. This is the minimum requirement for water to be stored, 90 to 100 minutes. At least for one, 90 minutes is nothing but one and a half hours more than 1 or 40 minutes, at least 1 or 40 minutes the water should be available to, uh, to suffice the fire. So that is the calculation which we have to keep in mind. Storage tanks of a capacity of 4,50,000 liters is normally provided in industrial establishment. In industrial establishment you do not need to worry directly you can plan for 4,50,000 liters of tank double compartment can be po possible to think. So that can be done. So water storage recommended by TAC based on the type of the risk. Nature of the risk, 
लाइट हजार्ड ऑर्डिनरी हजार्ड हाई हजार्ड हाई हजार्ड बी सो द कैपेसिटी रिजर्व फॉर स्टैटिक स्टोरेज एक्सक्लूसिवली फॉर फायर हाइड्रेंट सर्विसेस सो द फायर हाइड्रेंट सर्विसेस विच वी आर यूजिंग वॉटर फ्रॉम द स्टैटिक स्टोरेज इफ इट इज लाइट हजार्ड इट द कैपेसिटी should not be less than 135000 liters not less than 1 hours aggregate pumping capacity with a minimum of it should be able to cope at least for 1 hour so minimum of 135000 liters for light hazard structures for ordinary hazard not less than 2 hours 2 hours it has to support so the aggregate pumping capacity should be for 2 hours for high hazard in that also a category 3 hours of aggregate pumping capacity should be there and for high hazard b category 4 hours of aggregate pumping capacity should be there ordinary hazard light hazard high hazard high hazard b category so maximum even if you take the highest hazard 4 hours of uh, pumping capacity should be there and the storage capacity should be there for that many hours so now the storage tank is been discussed but there is one more category which we have to look at fire pump the pump which is used for pumping the water from the store fire water tank has to be appropriate so it's an integral component of a total fire protection system that is the most important thing it cannot fail at any cost so fire pump has to be regularly checked and monitored a fire protection system at a facility may include automatic sprinkler systems stand pipes hose stations and fire hydrants so this fire pump itself includes facilities uh, uh, it can uh, accommodate water to automatic automatic sprinkler systems hose stations if we are using fire hydrants for that also it can be it can accommodate water stand pipes this is just a schematic diagram of fire water pump house schematic say for example we have like 2 lakh 50000 capacity of water reservoir that is a tank sum okay now uh, to lift this to the overhead tank and then pass it to the other structure or can be directly passed to each and every system like if we are using sprinklers it, in the building it can be directly taken to those pipes so in that case motor and pump is necessary so the reservoir reservoir has to be at higher level motor and pump can be at lower level right so from the motor and pump two connections can be taken one from the reservoir the water is suction that is suction header is kept and from there it goes to the hydrant system for the water hydrant system it is passed and then to the delivery header delivery headers could be uh, sprinkler systems etc so we discussed about the pipe uh, pumping which is very very essential for uh, allowing the easy flow of the water for fire water piping piping is also very essential and it has to be maintained properly as per the code advising for the piping systems so a hydrant system consists of a network of water piping any hydrant system that is whether you use sprinkler or water hydrant any system it has a network of water piping when we are using water as a source of suppression fire suppression then the white uh, network of water piping is done essential for that so the fire hydrant system is designed to provide water at any given time any given time there should be water provided in that hydrant system so fire service pipeline should be sized as per the codes of fire protection manual for installing the pipes 
whether the material, the size of it, the requirement of the uh, sections, what sections has been required, joints, everything has been discussed in the fire protection manual. We, it, the codes for that from that manual has to be followed if we have to utilize the uh, uh, fire waters uh, hydrant system in the building. So, we have to check the fire protection manual for the piping system to check the standards. That fire protection manual is published by the Tariff Advisory Committee, TAC, Tariff Advisory Committee as well as relevant to Indian standards. So, fire control, there is one more uh, requirement which we have to have, there is something called as fire control room. Here, we can even have a control room for water supply. So, a separate room of fire resistant construction that provides an area from which firefighting operations or the em other emergency procedures can be directed or controlled. It cannot be used for any other purposes. It can, con it contains controls, panels, telephones associated with the buildings, fire services. It must comply with relevant regulations. So, you can even have a fire control room, control room in the within the campus whether adjoined to the building or outside the building. If you are spreading the building, it can be one of the part of it. If it is a high rise building, it can be adjoined or it can even be in the basement or ground which is easily accessible. But it should have all the controls, fire controls, fire panels. Telephones associated for the whole building structure whether number of flows is 100, 200 whatever all the telephone services should be there with the building telephones which is associated for fire services. So, all these controls, panels etc. should be installed in that fire control room. So, that fire control room should have a proper uh, construction technique so that it can withstand the fire. According to the code of practices, we have certain, uh, certain ways of uh, uh, looking at stairways, ramps and doors for these categories of buildings. These categories of buildings we discussed in the last unit. So, how, based on the occupants per unit, the exit width is planned. For stairways 25 mm, ramps 50, doors 75. Mostly almost everything we have is uh, 25, 50, 75. So, what does it mean? Now, travel distance for occupancy and type of construction. In this type, all the code of practices which is taken from NBC National Building Code Part 4 will have these kind of tables. Now, this discusses about travel distance for occupancy and type of constructions. So, here for residential, for uh, maximum travel distance should be 30 meters and 22.25 meters for type 3 and type 4. These are type 1 and type 2 are based on the construction materials like type 1 could be the brick, brick construction, concrete construction, smut constructions etc. So, that uh, constructions can be referred again in the NBC. So, for these type 1 and type 2 minimum 30 meters travel distance should be there for providing a fire exit or a fire staircase. So, for example, if we have a building like this, say this is 30 meters and 45 meters, right. So, now if this is a residential building like an apartment, for type 1 and type 2 minimum 30 meter travel distance should be there. And for type 3 and type 4, 22.5 meters travel distance should be there. At any point of the, uh, at any, say for example, if I am traveling here, if there is a fire, exist, fire exit or fire staircase planned here, 
for me the travel distance inside the corridor should be the whole length of this should be equal to 30 meter if it is type 1 type 2 at any point now since this is 45 meters from here it can be more than 35 the length of this can be more than 35 so the other option is there can be a provision of one more fire exit or fire staircase at other corner so that equally it is divided now 45 is 22 and half by 22 and half so people at any point can easily travel to the fire exit easily so this is the criteria for designing the uh, fire exits in the uh, building so this is based on the type of the construction for educational like for colleges and all which you are designing it can be 30 meters and 22.5 meters for type 3 and type 4 institutional also same 30 and 22.5 for assembly buildings for public buildings right for public buildings it is more 30 meters to 30 meters based on the occupancy based on the now in the assembly building it could be lesser than lesser occupancy than educational and institutional and residential so it is less 30 meters is sufficient for people to walk when the fire occurs they need to walk 30 meters and then they exit directly to the outside so business mercantile assembly they all have 30 30 meters industrial has 45 meters industrial has 45 meters and storage has 35 30 meters hazardous has 22.5 now there is a note in this for fully sprinklered building the travel distance may be increased by 50 percent of the value specified this is for the building which does not have any facility like sprinkler systems hydrants etc maybe there are extinguishers that's it but then if there is a building which is completely designed based on the um, sprinkler system fully fire sprinkler system is provided this travel systems may be increased by 50 percent of the same value now 30 meters means it can go up to 45 meters so the distance can be easily maintained Ramp shall be protected with automatic sprinkler systems and shall be counted as one of the means of escape. So, in the same way, uh, we have, yeah, so that is about codes of practice how the travel distance has to be planned, fire exits has to be planned. Now, there are two different uh, ways of uh, addressing. Uh, fire passive fire protection and active fire protection in passive fire protection so we will discuss these two things in detail passive fire protection is about containing the fire while active fire protection is about stopping the fire so passive fire protection is about containing the fire it can still contain but the hazard uh, hazardous activities can be reduced while active fire protection is about stopping the fire to be the source or the fire or the flame has to be stopped so that is active fire protection two ways of doing the protection active versus fire, passive fire protection passive fire protection breaks the building into compartments and prevents the spread of fire through the use of fire resistance rated walls and floors it utilizes fire doors to help further compartmentalize the structure and dampers to prevent the spread of fire and smoke throughout the ducts of the buildings so there are different components discussed in just one of these uh, just in this slide so we are talking about passive fire protection in passive fire protection what is the main intention to stop the fire uh, sorry to contain the fire passive is to contain the fire so that it does not spread from one point to another point so that can be done breaks the building into compartments now 
this is a planning strategy. So, to have this passive fire protection, the planning strategy be, has to be worked out for the whole building design. You have to compartment, uh, compartmentalization of the space to be, space has to be done to control the fire and prevents the spread of the fire through the use of a fire resistant serrated walls. How can it also be stopped before spreading to another compartment by using a fire res resistant rated walls and floors. So, this is a technical term and uh, this is uh, fire resistant rated walls and floors. These can be constructed on basis of the number of hours required for the resistance to happen. It can be 2 hours, 3 hours, 4 hours. So, the materials and the design of walls and floors should be such that it can contain the fire for 2 hours or 3 hours. So, the whole floors and walls and doors are designed with that respect. So, we will discuss that in detail in the further slides. It utilizes fire doors. Fire doors also can be fire rated. To help further compartmentalize the structure and dampers. Dampers are one more uh, uh, way of uh, protecting the passive fire. Uh, so, to prevent the spread of the fire and smoke throughout the ducts of the building. So, these can be uh, utilized for co controlling the passive fire. There are much more details to be looked upon. Uh, we can uh, look these uh, different strategies and techniques in the further session. Thank you.